Welcome to the Confidential Bulletin Podcast, brought to you by the California Restaurant Association. Pretty excited to have two guests today who are going to talk to us about PAGA. Not the PAGA reform effort that we are, uh, as an association, embarking on. For more on that, go to fixpaga.com. But we're going to talk about the history of PAGA, like how the hell did this even become a law? And now for a word from our sponsor. Isn't it amazing we live in a world where we can pretty much get anything we need when we need it delivered right to our door? It's bananas. I love the convenience. I lost my charger, but got one quick through DoorDash. DoorDash, your door to more. Download the DoorDash app now to get almost anything from pet food to snacks to neck braces to alcohol to toothpaste to Joy-Con controllers to headphones to... you get it. Must be 21 or older to order alcohol. Drink responsibly. Alcohol available only in select markets. Welcome, everybody. We're honored to have two uh, great and very smart guests with us today, Benjamin Ebbing or Ben Ebbing and uh, David Lanier. Ben is with Fisher Phillips Law Firm, where he is partner in their Sacramento and Washington, D.C. offices and co-chair of their government relations practice group. Uh, David Lanier is principal at Lanier Consulting, a firm that provides consulting services to clients who are navigating California's unique and complex labor management, government, and political landscape. I might add, unique and complex is a a charitable description. Um, They've joined us today because we're talking about PAGA, or the California Private Attorney General Act, otherwise known as the Sue Your Boss Law. Uh, Specifically, we're going to be talking about the history of PAGA and both David and Ben have had, you know, front row seats to the evolution of the law, of the PAGA saga. Um, At the time the law was considered and passed by the legislature, Ben served as the chief consultant to the Committee on Labor and Employment. Um, And when it was being considered, actually, Ben, I just read an analysis. You, You wrote the analysis for the committee. Yeah, those are uh, one of those things that comes back to haunt you, you know. (laughs) So I I was with the committee from late 2002 until about 2017 and probably heard, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of bills during that time, wrote analyses on bills. And I got to tell you guys, like Pog is the one that comes back to haunt me Uh, when I when I think back to being there, being in the room when Pago was enacted and. Uh, the amendments to it the year later and, and subsequently down the road. It's it's the one that keeps me up at night and um, makes me wonder if we could have done a better job uh, at the time. So, so that was that was in two thousand. So it, it, two thousand three, when it was moving through the legislature, uh, and at that time, you know, David Lanier, who uh, served from two thousand and thirteen to two thousand and nineteen as Jerry Brown's. Labor Secretary and Senior Advisor, uh, and you know we'll, we'll talk about you know some of your experience in your efforts to bring some transparency to PAGA, David, as uh, Governor Brown's Labor Secretary. But you also were in the uh, served in the legislature as uh, um, in the Speaker's office as an advisor to the Speaker of the Assembly for from from 1999 to 2011. So you were around when this thing was moving through the legislature as well. I, I, I was indeed. I have to say, I wasn't doing a lot of policy work in those days. I was more on the communication side. So uh, well, I probably have a boss that voted for it, at least one. But uh. So I guess just as far as history goes, I mean, while this was all happening in the legislature and it was – you know, a a relatively novel approach to uh, enforcement of any law. And I think a lot of the, you know, the business representatives, uh, you know, in, you know, advocates, lobbyists in the Capitol building at the time, their hair was on fire. And I think a lot of the advocates were trying to draw attention to this, uh, this law to get maybe some public sediment um, against it. Uh, But but nobody was paying attention because it was probably one of the more tumultuous political eras in California's history. Uh, that was around the time when Gray Davis was, uh, you know, being recalled for, among other things, you know, people blaming him for the um, 
the the mugging, the Enron mugging of California ratepayers, the electricity crisis, the budget deficit at the time was thirty eight billion, uh, the car tax, the workers' comp crisis. I mean, what was it like? Uh, I mean, Ben, when you were, you know, sort of in the legislature and you know dealing with you know, the public policy issues. Was anybody paying attention to anything that was going on in the Capitol building in those days? Yeah, it was It was a fascinating time. I, you know, I don't think we've quite seen another time like that. And I think it all, you know, came into play with respect to, to PAGA and the aligning of the stars to how we got, you know, the statute. So, you know, PAGA came through our committee in, in 2003, like you said, a novel approach. Um, you know, just by way of background, the, the legislature had spent a couple of years in the committee I worked for, the Assembly Labor Committee, had spent a few years digging into enforcement, the state of labor law enforcement in California, and had done a number of, you know, informational hearings and, and other investigations that really, you know, I, I think showed that enforcement was challenged in California. We had, you know, it was, as you said, we had a uh, budget deficit. It was just after the dot-com bust, um, you know, hiring people to do enforcement within the state of California was difficult. So there were a few years before the PAGA bill came forward that that was sort of the focus of, of our committee certainly was making the case that there just was inadequate uh, state enforcement. I remember one, I think one of the statistics we came out with was there were more fish and game wardens in California than there were Cal OSHA inspectors. That may still be the case. I don't know. But that was sort of, you know, uh, something uh, people hung their hat on. So that was sort of the background. And then the PAGA proposal, which was very novel, um, but, you know, premised on this argument that the state just doesn't have the resources. We're not going to have the resources anytime soon to get enforcement up there. We need to think outside the box. We need to uh, deputize private attorneys to uh, bring these, uh, you know, cases for civil civil penalties uh, and allow uh, those to be recovered in private lawsuits. I would say, you know, Gray Davis was a pretty moderate guy. Um, you know, he, he had some very, uh, you know, a uh, lot of labor credibility, did some big things with labor. He brought back the eight hour day uh, with AB60 and others. But there was a lot of dissatisfaction among labor when I came into the legislature in 2002 with Gray Davis and that he wasn't, a, you know, as progressive as, as folks wanted. So there was a real, um, you know, push uh, to, to make him more progressive. When the bill went through, I got to tell you, not the kind of bill I, th I thought Gray Davis was going to sign. Um, you know, members voted on it on policy grounds, but uh, thinking back, I, it was just was, was not one that I thought was actually going to get signed into law. And then the dynamic occurred that you talked about. We had this recall election going on, uh, and everything got thrown out the win window when it comes to politics. You know, when somebody's facing an existential crisis like that, it's difficult to predict how they're going to vote on a certain issue. Uh, and I think, you know, by the time Paga made it to Gray Davis's desk, uh, I'm pretty sure he had already been recalled, if, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, there was also some uh, movement in the business community, um, some groups that actually endorsed the recall. Uh, and I think that, you know, what I heard is that that engendered some anger. So by the time the bill got to the governor's desk, it was just a completely different landscape in terms of trying to predict politically, is this a bill somebody like Gray Davis is going to sign? So sort of a weird aligning of these strange politics that were going on in the early 2000s uh, resulted in this uh, situation where the bill got signed into law. Um, and then it, it was the legislature was different, different place at that time. And we can talk later about some of the reforms that came after Gray Davis signed the bill. But remember, the legislature was a very different place, you know, numbers wise, just politically. When I started in 2002, I think there were 48 Democrats in the assembly uh, and you needed 41 votes to get a bill. So you had that six or seven votes of, you know, truly moderate Democrats who had some leverage. They knew, uh, you know, their their votes were needed to get to 41. Um, and so, you know, that created some interesting dynamics. We also had at that time, uh, we did not have majority vote budgets, uh, meaning uh, it took more than 41 votes to pass a budget. You had to get two thirds. You had to get 54 votes. So at that time, uh, you know, we had 48 Democrats. You needed six Republican votes to get a budget. And so that uh, created a situation where the Republicans were able to utilize some leverage on policy issues. Um, uh, uh, you know, and every year to get their votes, they had a laundry list of things they were asking for. And so that came into play as, you know, we can talk about further 
um, after Pogger was signed and some reforms were made. But yeah, the political landscape was just completely different. The makeup of the legislature was different. The rules that governed, uh, you know, how, how things got out of the legislature were different. And I think that all, you know, contributed to that situation when Pogger was signed. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you, you talk about the, the unions weren't totally satisfied with, you know, how, how uh, Gray Davis was sort of treating the issues that were important to them. It, was it, be, you know, because I, I, the recall began in earnest uh, in 2003 around March was when the signature collection started. And, you know, I, and I think sort of labor had just, you know, uh, Gray Davis had just been elected the year before to a second term. But, you know, before Gray Davis, they had been, you know, 16 years in the in the wilderness with, uh, you know, two Republican uh, governors preceding Gray Davis. And I, I suspect that they were a little nervous that this thing could, you know, perhaps maybe early on they thought, well, no governor in California has ever been uh, recalled uh, from office. And in fact, you know, at that time, there has been only one governor in the country that was recalled back in 1921 from North Dakota. Uh, so maybe they just didn't think it was it was real. But but yeah, to your point, Ben, um, he was recalled on October 7th was the, the day the election happened. And he signed the PAGA bill uh, on October 10th, three days later. And I think some people will say, well, yeah, his last, it was, I, as I understand it, one of his last official acts. And they said it was either, you know, sort of a showing his gratitude for the unions who spent, you know, many, many, you know, uh, hours, you know, for thousands of them knocking on doors, trying to save Gray Davis's political career and spent probably countless dollars on, on the campaign, but it was either one, a thank you for trying to help me survive, or two, the middle finger to the business community who at by that and had endorsed Arnold Schwarzenegger. That, that's that's uh, the understanding uh, I have as well. Now I wasn't in the room. I not what wasn't in Gray Davis's head, but I do think it's one of those possibilities. And I, frankly, the story I was told that it was more the latter. You know, the big middle finger. <laughs> um, you, you know, but I, I do think safe to say, like it's just. It was a unique situation. The pl political dynamics were were unique. Probably what was going through the governor's head was unique. Uh, you know, if this had been a normal year, no recall going on, I suspect this may have been a bill that had a veto with a message like, I want this to be worked on further. Um, I'm intrigued by the concept, but this needs some more work and clarification. But, you know, the politics such as it was, it's not what we saw. We saw the law get signed as is, and then we've been scrambling ever since to try to fix uh, fix something. So, so I mean, so David, uh, this is this was before you were uh, appointed uh, Labor Secretary of California, but the argument at the time, it seemed, you know, con convenient, right? Well, we have a budget deficit; it's a record budget deficit. We don't have the ability to, you know, hire more more and more enforcement staff than the fish and game. And so we're just going to sort of outsource, you know, enforcement to private attorneys. But, you know, California, especially at that time, was, you know, uh, the, a, 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 the first Democrat governor, uh, you know, in 16 years, the unions were kind of getting their agenda through. They were uh, adopting, you know, worker protection proposals, and there was some pride, right? And I think even today, uh, uh, California policymakers will will uh, you know brag that you know California has some of the most stringent labor laws um, in the country, if not the world. But for as they were going through the the budget at the time, making cuts, doesn't it sort of just seems like it was almost an abandonment of the workers. Like if you're going to set priorities, if you're proud of these worker protection laws, uh, why aren't you willing to, you know, fund the enforcement? Um, and that, that was the argument that was raised back then, budget deficit. Well, here we are 20, 20 years later, uh, and there is, you know, some ref PAGA reform in the air. Of course, uh, for those listeners, you know that uh, the... Um, there is a PAGA reform measure on uh, the ballot uh, set for November 2024 this year. Uh, and then also there is, you know, um, some a, discussions and movement afoot in the legislature um, of discussing 
potential reform. Uh, and for more information on that, go to fixpaga.com. Uh, David, w- you know, what do you say about the, we don't have enough money to fund enforcement uh, in 2024. So uh, why don't we just stick with the current system? Yeah, it's a great segue, Jot. The circumstance, some of the circumstances have not changed. Like we're every ten years, and sometimes all in between those periods, we're talking about the lack of enforcement, the lack of funding, the problems at uh, the Department of Industrial Relations, whether it be Cal OSHA, which is in the headlines a lot right now, uh, the Labor Commissioner's Office, and at that time, you know, Pago looked to be a pretty convenient solution to save some general fund money. You know, we'll we'll make cuts and we'll have this safety net, if you will, of PAGA and we'll have private enforcement. And, you know, Ben did a great job capturing the history. I'll just say it was a very savvy alliance by labor. They, you know, they partnered up with the plaintiff's bar. They brought in the nonprofit worker advocates and that is an extremely powerful trifecta amongst Democrats in the legislature then and now. Uh, and so, you know, nobody wants to vote against it. I, I suspect, and I'll say it's speculation, those six or seven moderates that Ben called out were hugely influential in those days. But the question of what legislation they engaged or did not engage on, it's a little tough to discern how those decisions were made. But when it's a bill that has so many core Democratic constituencies supporting it, and you don't, I think it's pretty clear most people didn't think Gray Davis would sign that bill until those recall dynamics played out the way you, you've discussed. And so the moderates didn't engage. You know, it was almost motherhood and apple pie for the Democrats in the legislature. Let's let's save some budget money. Let's still protect, say we're protecting workers. Let's keep our these interest groups happy. And, you know, all these years later, we've got PAGA, we've got employers having paid out on record over $8 billion in settlements. And what's changed? To your question, Jot, there is a funding mechanism now that's not general fund for those enforcement agencies. Employers pay for the enforcement, and they have for many years, uh, since shortly after the budget crisis of the early 2000s, those entities, the enforcement entities have been funded by employers through assessments on their workers' comp policies. So it's no longer, the general fund argument doesn't hold anymore. Uh, And there's a very robust debate going on right now about why we don't have better enforcement, uh, given that funding isn't the limitation. So uh, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking at the analysis that you wrote, Ben, uh, in the Assembly Labor Employment Committee. And uh, I got to call out, there was, uh, you, you know, you, you did a great job at sort of presenting the arguments. I mean, that's your, you, that was your job at the time, not to have a viewpoint, but to... Yeah, I would say I, one thing I pride myself on was trying to present both sides. And I think that's the job of the official committee analysis is present the arguments on both sides in a fair manner, let the members decide. I, I, I think what I've seen in, in some areas recently is um, a lack of that objectivity. The committee analyses I read now, I'm not saying the labor committee, but some of the other ones I, I, I read, they really go to task to take down you know, the opposition arguments that the you know, powers that be don't agree with. And it's almost like they're calling them out, um, highlighting any flaw, perceived flaws in any argument. And I would say my philosophy was not to do that necessarily. That wasn't my job. My job was to present the arguments unless I saw something that was glaringly false or relied on false information, but to present the arguments both sides made and let the members decide. Yeah. And because it was a, you know, a novel approach to uh, enforcement uh, and there wasn't a lot of precedent um, in in a lot of the committee deliberations and written in a number of analyses. And I think you had also alluded to, well, there is this other law, uh, uh, Business and Professions Code 17200, the unfair competition law, that uh, also has a similar structure where it allows you know citizens to enforce 
on the business, you know, business and professions code. And it was almost like that was being used as, well, you know, this thing works. But also, I mean, going on at that time was that whole, what I think it was the Trevor Law Group in Los Angeles and the John and Ken radio show in LA made this sort of their, you know, the, the centerpiece of their, their entire show for probably a year. And it resulted in Prop 64 that, you know, undid essentially that that section of the law because, you know, the lawyers were abusing it. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I mean, it's sort of a double-edged sword, right? I mean, on the one hand, unfair competition law, BNP 17200 was sort of used as an example, like a model, like we can do this. But you're right. At that time, there was intense concern, debate, testimony in the legislature about some of the abuses of that law that were going on. And I, I was looking at my analysis the other day because, uh, uh, you know, at one point um, there's some discussion of uh, the arguments, the caution uh, from the business community about, look what happened, you know, in the unfair competition law. You're just going to replicate that. And the arguments back from the other side, from labor and the plaintiff's bar, are almost quaint. You know, they said, well, unfair competition, you can sue on behalf of the general public. And you can't do that under pocket. You have to have an aggrieved employee and, and these kind of type of arguments. But, you know, what we've seen is it's just the profit motives was too high. In in PAGA, where you have these penalties that add up, they're per employee, per pay period, per violation. Uh, they have the, you know, potential to just sort of um, dramatically escalate. And combined with the fact that there's not a harm requirement under PAGA, you know, no showing that the employee has to actually have suffered any financial or physical harm of any type. And so that was sort of the perfect storm where you just have this lawsuits with huge civil penalties and no requirement that you have to show actual harm. So that gave rise to these very hyper-technical lawsuits uh, that we saw over the years about very minor things, typos on the pay stub, misspelling of you know the name of the, the employer. Uh, and so it was sort of a, a perfect storm. The other thing I, thing I think is telling about the unfair competition example and what I tried to raised later on in my career in the in the committee was I started to think and hear reports about real abuses going on. And so I went, you know, to labor and the plaintiff attorneys and I said, you know, guys, I think some of this has some truth to it. I think we can fix some of this stuff. Uh, but if you don't, we could face an unfair competition uh, lawsuit situation. And it's sort of the same model. Like, for years and years and years, the legislature heard complaints about the unfair competition law and did little to nothing to fix it. So then what do you see? People go to the ballot and you have big dramatic changes to the law. And so I use that as a cautionary tale when I was trying to have some common sense uh, conversations with the proponents of Pocket and say, look, I think there's a way to weed out some of the abuses and preserve the core of what you were trying to protect. But there's just uh, this dynamic of... And David, you've probably seen it in other contexts as well, like no uh, willingness to acknowledge any problems with a law that you've, you know, pushed to be enacted. There's some feeling that if I acknowledge there's some abuse, then it undermines my credibility or the whole law goes away. And so even in the abusive situations, we saw a little if any willingness to do anything. And David was involved in some, some reforms through the governor's office and he can tell stories about that, you know, really, uh, you know, pulling teeth that it took to get those in retrospect, some of them were pretty modest reforms to Paga, but very common sense, but even getting those, um, the amount of political capital that, that governor Brown had to exert and David had to go through um, extracting these changes out of labor was just, it's, it's almost the exact same situation. A law that, you know, you just can't prevail upon common sense for the advocates to make reasonable, rational changes. uh, Despite (laughs) repeated attempts, numerous years in the legislature. And I almost think at the end of the day, there's no choice, but to go um, back to the voters and say, you know, can you bring some common sense here? Because the legislature has abdicated their responsibility to do so. Yeah. And I, and I do want to uh, ask you, David, but before I do about the reform 
uh, attempts and sort of some of the transparency reforms that um, were enacted uh, under PAGA. I have to read an excerpt uh, from Ben's analysis in the Assembly Labor Committee, uh, which was prophetic. It was delivered by the California Motor Car Dealers Association, who I might add uh, have been leaders in the effort to reform PAGA for many years and, and props to their president and CEO, Brian Moss, who has been uh, a true leader in this effort. And actually um, him and um, Dave Puglia, the head of the Western Growers Association, and of course, Jennifer Barrero with the Chamber of Commerce, and, and along with the Restaurant Association were you know the players to get this reform measure put on the ballot. But here's what the motor car dealers stated when this bill was moving back in 2003, saying um, this is, the, they state, a private enforcement statue in the hands of unscrupulous lawyers is a recipe for disaster. That was 20 years ago. Here we are. And then, of course, the um, CJAC argued that it will expose businesses to frivolous lawsuits and create a new litigation cottage industry for unelected private attorneys performing the duties of a public agencies whose staffs are responsible to the general public. Man, I'm going to Tahoe if I can predict uh, things with that accuracy. I'm going to Tahoe tonight. Yeah, 100 percent. 100 percent. Yeah. So, so David, I think the predictions, which, which I found interesting, and I think you had mentioned to, to this to me some time ago, I, I think the predictions were, all right, this thing, if this becomes law, a week after this takes effect, we're going to see these lawsuits start to come. And that didn't really happen, did it? I mean, we saw the, the abuse of this law occur sometime later. What what are your observations on when that happened, and and then I want to get into your 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 working for Jerry Brown. Chuck, can I go back to, to yeah, Ben Embi, of course, a labor policy consultant, for a minute? He's probably he's cringing because we're wearing him out on it. But I I just got to say Ben was widely viewed as a fair broker between the sides, and there weren't too many consultants in those days who had respect on both sides from labor and management. Uh, and, and Ben did with, particularly on the labor side, a standard that he described very accurately. They want what they want and they want all of it and they don't want to give anything back once they have it. Extremely difficult position and we can get in more to efforts to fix it. Ben made, he was in the middle of at least two that I can think of and uh, he and I were a chorus of two, maybe separated by a few years uh, early on for that same message that he articulated, which is fix this thing or you're going to lose it. Like there's, there's smoke here. There's real smoke here. There's going to be a fire. And I appreciate those words, David. And I remember some phone calls you and I had about, <laughs> we see it. How come, you know, these folks just don't see it. And I mean, it's weird as time went on. I think you, you said I had credibility with both management and labor, but you know, they got tired of hearing me about Paga, labor did. And so I think, you know, my credibility with them waned towards the end of my career because they just wanted to, you know, not hear it anymore. Stop talking about Paga, Ben. We, we, do, we don't want to do anything. Why do you keep bringing Paga up? So such as it may, I think my, my credibility on that side went a little uh, down towards the end of my career, particularly about Paga, because I kept saying, you guys, we got to do something. There's stuff we can do here to take away this frivolous stuff uh, happening on the edges. Um, but they just didn't want to do it. So, well, you made a yeoman's effort, and uh, it's uh, very challenging. I, I will say, you were right in the end, and as as predictive as C Jack and uh, the car dealers were of what would happen uh, internally, you were you were waving the flag and trying to get them to do the right thing. We, you know, there was a an effort to fix the pay stub. You know, there's so many abuses of the pay stub of two two six and that's just silly. And, uh, I was chief deputy of legislative affairs when that bill came down to governor Brown and we hoped it would work. I mean, unfortunately it didn't really work, but he was happy to sign it. And it was a uh, relief to me to bring governor Brown jot something that at least purported to try to fix some of the problems that he'd been hearing about. And I've shared with you, you know, he was mayor of Oakland and then 
ran for attorney general, became attorney general, and then ran for governor. And, and what he told me is that every stop along the way through that process, businesses complained to him about being sued. And I don't know who coined the phrase, sue your boss law. I think it may have been him. That's certainly in the first place I heard it as a then younger legislative aide to the governor bringing him labor code amendments and him saying, if I sign this, will there be something else added to that sue your boss law? And I'll, I'll confide. I had to go like consult with people that knew labor law better than I did because I had a vast portfolio in those days. So what the hell is this sue your boss law that the governor's talking about? And lo and behold, it's PAGA. And every time we broaden the labor code, another potential violation arose under PAGA. And the governor was sick and tired of hearing about it. He was sick and tired of hearing about it from businesses all over the state, whether he was mayor, attorney general, or governor. And that really was the impetus for the, uh, the direction that I was given to try to go yet again, get some reforms, get labor to come to their senses a little bit and moderate some. Do you of remember, and- do you, David, do you remember when he, he approached you and said, do something about this? Yeah, you know, it was over a period of, of time, Jot, because I went to work for him in 2011, about halfway through the year, again, in legislative affairs as the chief deputy. And that's when I started hearing from him about any labor code changes and how frustrated he was with it. So he expressed initially an appetite for fixes and changes. And Ben, I'm going to forget when the the pay stub fix went came down. I think that was a little bit later. I want to say 2015, somewhere in that period and mm, okay I'm, maybe i'm wrong yeah my, sorry my, i should have done, I done my homework together, better but, uh, you know the way that came up was you know so my chair of the committee at the time was uh assembly member roger hernandez and he was approached by shannon grove who you know every year would want, run three paga reform bills and they would all get shot down in committee if they even had a hearing and so but he had a good relationship with her and they had you know uh, a, a good dialogue. And I remember just being in meetings and she would bring constituents from her district and show these lawsuits that are based off of typos in the pay stub. The chair of the committee, to his credit at the time, said, that sounds like BS to me. Like we, we ought to be able to fix that. Can't we do something? So that's what generated that proposal, which as David said, was really modest and unfortunately didn't even fix the problem for, for a variety of legal reasons. But um that's what sort of was the impetus for that. And and frankly, it only got any legs and got any traction because the chair of the labor committee took it on as a pet issue. And so labor had to give him a little bit of leash to uh, – they couldn't just shut down the chair of the labor committee like they could a Shannon Grove bill. Uh, and so that's the you know, only way we got some reform. And I think I remember – I was staffing that bill and I remember presenting it in the governor's office, talking to David and others. And I think David stepped out. We were talking to somebody else and David pokes his head in the door and he says, is that all you could do in that bill? You can get more. Come on, you got to get some more. So that's just an indication of what David was hearing, uh, you know, from, from governor Brown about trying to get some common, what I think are really common sense reforms to this statute. Yeah, it's a good, I don't remember that, Ben, but I, it sounds accurate. <laughs> and, and then I went on to find out how hard it was to get reforms. So, John, to answer your question, you know, the governor, I think, was on that message to me from early on about this is a problem. What can we do? You know, we got a couple, we got at least one answer from the legislature that was hard, hard won and, and, uh, Ben makes a good point again that it's just because the labor chair wanted it. Uh, I went off. I became labor secretary the end of 2013, and um, I've told this story before. Paga. Any employer who's been sued under Paga has received the infamous Paga notice, um, and uh, we hear in these debates about Paga how those notices give the labor agency and the labor commissioner, which is under the labor agency, an opportunity to review the cases and take the cases. And that this is a, it was advertised and it's been argued is a safety net, a, a different kind of safety net, if you will, uh, to avoid abuses of the system because the state can take the cases. Well, I'll just tell you, I walked into the labor agency on my first day 
as secretary. And there's two cubicles at the front of the office in those days, one with a, so, you know, a, a receptionist kind of person and another that was just stacked full of boxes. And, 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 and uh, if you were to look around behind the boxes, there was a scanner, a flatbed scanner. I mean, does anybody remember a flatbed scanner and a chair? And I was like, what, what is that? You know? And I, somebody, somebody finally said to me, it was kind of bugged me. I walked by a few, what is this? Somebody says to me, well, that's the Paga notices. I said, you got to be kidding me. What, what What do you mean? I mean, there's, there was thousands of these things stacked up. Well, they all come here, but we don't have any staff assigned to do anything with them. There's no positions funded in the budget. So we have one person half time coming out of, by the way, new labor secretary, your budget. And that person's job is to scan and record the PAGA notices. And they're, they're a little behind. Wow. <laughs> The boxes were above the top of the desk. You couldn't see the person where they were sitting in the desk. And that was, I, I'll just cut to the chase. That was the review of the PAGA notices. They got scanned in and disappeared. And we kept rough count of how many came in the door. There's no staff to review them, to do anything with them. If you found one that was egregious, it was just a complete paper tiger. That that was what foreshadowed efforts in 2015 and 2016 to get those reforms. And at that time, those notices were of no use to anyone. They weren't recorded accurately. Um, they didn't contain much useful information. Uh, once we started looking at those notices qualitatively, they were terrible. Many of them, not all of them. There were some good ones that met what the statute required, but others were absolutely cookie cutter. Every single one, just the name had been changed and you know they didn't tell us anything. So that, that was really, we ended up with a laundry list of ideas to fix PAGA in 2015 uh, that we brought to Governor Brown uh, for me to move forward as labor secretary on. And Ben has already also foreshadowed how challenging that was. There was no appetite for fixing PAGA beyond a pretty popular Democratic governor and the Secretary of Labor were insisting there were problems and that we needed to fix it. So we got some very modest reforms eventually, and we could talk about that process and how, how much resistance there was. But one of the reforms we got that really has fueled the information we have today was getting the settlements when an employer settled uh, required to be filed with the state and tracked and recorded and available. And when I said, you know, I said earlier in the in the podcast, we've got over eight billion in settlements. That's just the dollars we recorded since that fix went in in mid 2016. Um, so everything before that is basically unrecorded in terms of how many dollars in settlements. We got some other things then, but that's really been a way to illustrate just how much money how many cases are going on. There's more to the story of PAGA. Stay tuned for Episode 2 of Confidential Bulletin. And now for a word from the California Restaurant Association's legal partners. Hello, I'm Alden Parker. I'm an attorney with Fisher Phillips. I'm the co-chair of our national hospitality group. I'm also a proud member of the California Restaurant Association and part of its legal center. And this is Ask CRA. Operating a restaurant is tough. What's keeping you up at night? If you have questions you would like us to answer, please submit them on our website at C-A-L-R-E-S-T dot O-R-G forward slash A-S-K. That's calrest.org forward slash ask. Your question might be answered here on a future episode of Confidential Bulletin. All right. Well, I have a question now from a small restaurant operator. Uh, one of the questions that we often get and what we got in this case was, if I have a cook that tells me they're quitting immediately, when do I have to get them their final paycheck? Here in California, if someone quits immediately, the employer will have 72 hours to go ahead and issue a final paycheck that has all of their uh, wages uh, owed to them paid out on that final paycheck. But it's important for everybody to know, if you go ahead and let someone go, you have to have the paycheck immediately 
on their last date for them, ready to go and ready to be delivered to the employee. In addition, if someone gives you notice, meaning a day, 24 hours, 48 hours, or 72 or more hours, that time, that total time you have to issue that final paycheck will count. And so if they give you two weeks notice on their last day, you're going to have to get that final paycheck to them. I hope everybody goes ahead and uh, listens to this advice. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed Confidential Bulletin. Your membership helps us advocate statewide on your behalf. You can also access tools and education that can help you be a better and more profitable operator while connecting with more than 22,000 like-minded hospitality professionals just like you. If you are not a member, join us. Check us out at calrest.org. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal or professional advice. The views expressed in this podcast may not be those of the host or the management.